Good evening. Hello, thank you all for joining us. This is the Associates of the Boston Public Library's sixth annual Pierce performance. I'm delighted all of you are here to celebrate with us. Tonight we are marking both the 150th anniversary of Sergei Kusevinsky's birth, the 100th anniversary of his appointment with the Boston Symphony Orchestra as their music director, and his lasting legacy. Now I am delighted to turn over the podium to Jared Rex, the BPL's music curator, who dreamed up tonight's programming in concert with the BSO. Thank you very much, Jared. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jared Rex, and I'm the curator of music here at BPL. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, this is such a special year in 2024, since there are so many Kusevitsky anniversaries that we're celebrating. His arrival to Boston in 1924 heralded the start of a 25-year tenure that would forever transform both the orchestra he conducted, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and the state of contemporary classical music in this country. His activities to foster this art form and the work of its living composers far exceeded those of music, most music directors of his day. Today, many of the institutions supporting American music are built upon initiatives undertaken during Kusevitsky's Boston tenure. So today we remember him not only as a conductor, but as a music publisher, philanthropist, educator, and benefactor. At Boston Public Library, the Serge Kusevitsky collection was formally accepted on December 15, 1966, due to the generosity of his widow, Olga Kusevitsky. It was Olga's lifelong dream to preserve his memory in a publicly accessible library, and it finally came to fruition through the acquisition of this gift to this institution. It principally contains materials from Kusevitsky's personal library, such as musical scores, photographs, scrapbooks, ephemera, and other objects belonging to the Kusevitskys. Until recently, all of the items in this collection were not accessible digitally, so in preparation for this special year, I am pleased to report that 541 musical scores from the collection have been cataloged in BPL's online catalog. 109 scores and 241 photographs have been digitized on Digital Commonwealth. So for the first time in this institution's history, this Kusevitsky collection is finally making its way to the internet. And every year, yeah, I know, right? It's, it's a huge undertaking. Every year, the Pierce Performance Series is dedicated to making BPL's special collections come alive through performances that are inspired by our collections and the items in, that they contain. So I'm extremely grateful to the Boston Symphony Orchestra for partnering with us on this endeavor and to the associates for making this dream a reality. In closing, it's my hope that this year's Pierce Performance Series will once again highlight Kusevitsky's countless and significant contributions to music in this city and this country, as well as to continue to enshrine these vast contributions as cornerstones that shaped Boston's musical history during the 20th century. All in all, Kusevitsky's devotion to classical music elevated the cultural landscape of Boston, and through this rich legacy persists into the present through BPL's continued stewardship of this collection. Thank you for coming to tonight's program, and now please welcome the Associates Vice Chair Usha Pasi. I am Usha Pasi. I have the honor of serving as the Vice Chair of the Associates of the Boston Public Library. For those of you who know us, you know what extraordinary responsibility we fill for the city. But for those of you who don't, the Associates is an independent nonprofit dedicated to preserving and promoting the historic, literary, and artistic treasures of the BPL through targeted grant making to the Boston Public Library and to cultural events like the ones that we're having tonight. Through your generosity, and those of many who are not here, the Associates funds 10 full-time BPL staff positions in special collections, including our wonderful Jared Rex, who is curator of music. <laughs> this particular program is thanks to the generosity of Harold Whitworth Pierce Charitable Trust, and the Pierce Performance Series seeks to raise the visibility of our special collections through free public performances. We have an extraordinary committee led by Chair Anita Lincoln. Anita, would you rise so we can recognize you? Thank you. And we are also very grateful to the Boston Public Library. David Leonard, we are also grateful to Beth Prindle, the Director of Research and Special Collections, who guides our work. And Jared. I want to just say something briefly about our two speakers. It's what an honor it is to have two such learned individuals with us. I was just chatting with Tom Goodell. What is not in his 
a bio is that he is a Wolverine. Go Wolverines for all those University of Michigan people. I am now one by as a parent. But he began his broadcasting career at the University of Michigan in 1974. He has had numerous roles in the public radio space, which I think is an extraordinary contribution to society. He established the Kusevitsky Recording Society in 1987 to preserve and promote the legacy of Serge Kusevitsky. And we are thrilled to have his presence, his laughter, his joy, and his knowledge with us. Equally so, Harlow Robinson, who is an author, lecturer, and Northeastern University professor emeritus. He is the Matthews Distinguished University Professor of History Emeritus at North Northeastern, and he is a scholar that we should all look to for advice and to look back and then to look forward around music. He has written books on Sergei Prokofiev and Hollywood's Russians, and he is widely published in the media, including the Boston Globe, the New York Times, the LA Times, and has written program notes for the BSO, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, New York Phil, and the Metropolitan Opera. He, if I may say so, has written re essays for all of the BSO's Shostakovich recordings, releases on the Deu on Deutsche Grammophon. Tom and Harlow, would you join us on the stage? Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. You know, in my years as a professor at Northeastern, I often came to the BPL to use the wonderful collections here. It was very important. And as, as far as Kuzvitsky goes, you know, I, I was exposed to him when I was, I think, maybe eight or nine. <laughs> Uh, my mother used to take us to Tanglewood from Connecticut in the summer, and I remember his name. And then later on, when I started working on Prokofiev, of course, Kuzovitsky was one of Prokofiev's longest standing friends and mentors, and their correspondence was a huge source for me in working on Prokofiev, both the biography and translating the letters. So Kuzovitsky, yes, an enormous <laughs> figure. I'm so happy to be here with Tom, my collaborator and co-conspirator. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we did this program at Tanglewood this summer, and we're so happy to be back to, do, to be doing it here in, in Boston. You know, and I thought I would start with just one quotation from Kuzovitsky that seems so relevant right now. So long as culture and art exist, there is hope for humanity. And all those who believe in the values and inheritance of culture and art should stand in the front rank. If ever there was a time to speak of music, it is now in the new world. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a sort of dialogue here. And we have a number of images and audio clips that Tom has found in various places, both people speaking about Kuzovitsky, Kuzovitsky himself, some performances. I would just begin with the many talents of Kuzovitsky. You know, people don't even realize, yes, of course, he was the conductor of the BSO for 25 years, but he also was a publisher going back to before the revolution in, in Russia. He was an entrepreneur. He was a mentor. He created Tanglewood. <laughs> if he only did that alone, we would remember him, right? Mm -hmm. But he, he created Tanglewood. It was his idea. And this image here you see um, is actually maybe where he got the idea for Tanglewood. This is uh, outside one of the imperial palaces outside St. Petersburg, Pavlovsk. And at Pavlovsk were held these outdoor concerts in the summertime. Prokofiev performed there. And this is where Kuzovitsky also sort of got his start and got the idea, I think, perhaps, of having a summer festival out outdoors. So of course, his roots go way back to, to Russia. He also represents very much the American rags to riches story. Kuzovitsky, born in a small town of Vishny Valachok, <laughs> Russia. His father was an observant Jew and uh, played in the Klezmer Ensemble. Kuzovitsky was Jewish. It wasn't something that he talked about a lot, but he certainly acknowledged it and was very friendly towards Israel, as a matter of fact. This is somebody who made it absolutely on his own, coming to America later on. And very early on, he showed great initiative. You know, Kuzovitsky is often described as an instigator, and he was an instigator and always was taking initiative. A very ambitious fellow who knew that he had special talents and wanted to pursue them. At age 14, he ran away to Moscow, <laughs> to the big city, you know, which was sort of like uh, going to New York. And uh, he got himself into a musical school, even though at first they weren't going to admit him. He was a little late in the academic year. But then they told him, well, maybe if you're willing to play the double bass, 
<laughs> uh, because we don't have a lot of people who want to play the double bass, and we need one for the orchestra. And so he said, sure. And he took up the double bass. Not only did he take up the double bass, he became one of the greatest double bass players of his time, and later on actually composed music for, for the double bass. And you're going to be hearing much more about that in, in the next session of this series, which is really devoted to Kuzovitsky as a double bass player and a composer for the double bass. And he started touring as a double bass soloist, first in Russia, then in Europe, in Berlin, and then he actually hired an orchestra so he could, so he could play. So this is you know, very much where he started. But I wanted to ask Tom, what, since we're really talking today about American music and Kuzovitsky's contribution to American music and, the, and his recordings, what you consider to be the most important recording set? Kuzovitsky has made? Well, he recorded fairly extensively for his time. I think I counted over 250 titles the last time I looked, and Sony Records now owns all of the Kuzovitsky legacy. They're planning to do a 50-plus CD set that should be available in the next year or so, so look for that. He started recording in 1928. He recorded until 1951, almost exclusively with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And I think... You know, it's hard to choose, certainly his recordings of Tchaikovsky. The Tchaikovsky symphonies are unbeatable. And we were talking before, and I mentioned that when I was in, in school at the University of Michigan, go blue, by the way, <laughs> there was a music store near the music school, and I would stop by there periodically and would talk with the proprietor. And, and I said, well, you know, I really don't care for the Tchaikovsky symphonies. And he said, you need to hear Kusevitsky because he makes the music greater than it is. And even Tchaikovsky's brother, Modest, said, as long as Kuzovitsky lives, so will my brother's music. Right. So, so the Tchaikovsky recordings, the Prokofiev, there are amazing recordings of the Classical Symphony, the Fifth Symphony, Romeo and Juliet, Peter and the Wolf, which we'll hear an excerpt from later, and Sibelius, and the American composers. And we'll talk more about the American composers in a bit, but he recorded Copland, Howard Hansen, Roy Harris, some of the greatest music of his time that was being written in this country. And so I would, I would go to those as examples of, of Kuzovitsky at his yes. best. And here's a little audio clip of Kuzovitsky himself playing the slow movement from the concerto he wrote for double bass. And this is recorded in 1928 yes. when he was uh, not so active anymore as a bass right. player. Right. And well, you judge for yourselves. <laughs> Writing for the double bass, Kuzovitsky wanted it to sound more like the cello, he said that. Yes. And he actually tuned the strings uh, higher so that it would sound more like, more like a cello. And you know, this, this concerto is still heard uh, all over the world. It's a, a, a double bass soloist, it's a, it's a staple of their repertoire, which after all is not that large. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Now, Kuzovitsky also made a very shrewd marriage, one would have to say. He had an early marriage to a ballerina, but he said, oh, we were just both poor artists. And that only lasted for a couple of years. Then he met Natalia Ushkola, who was the daughter of one of the wealthiest men in Russia, a tea merchant. And you know how Russians like tea. So she had an enormous fortune that she inherited. And she was more than willing to use her money to help him in all of his enterprises. And this started very early on when he hired an orchestra in Berlin. Later on, when he came to the BSO, she was a very important sponsor of all of his activities. Also, really kind of his secretary. She wrote a lot of his letters. 
I noticed that in the correspondence with Prokofiev that very often it was actually Natalia who was writing the letters for him. So this was extremely important for his success and they lived together in Jamaica Plain. You know, he was very much rooted in the community here. You know, he lived in Jamaica Plain where he used to host people. Prokofiev stayed at his house. And then, of course, they had a house out in Tanglewood as well, that beautiful Saranac, which is way up on the top of a hill overlooking the Stockbridge Bowl. They didn't have children of their own, but uh, very much were mentors to lots of composers and musicians. And, you know, one of the things that he did very early on was he was a popularizer of music in Russia, and he took a ship down the Volga with his orchestra on it. <laughs> And they stopped at all these little villages along the Volga, which had never been exposed to this kind of music before. And it was sort of a, a harbinger of what he would do later on. And even early in his career, he got very involved with some very important composers, especially, for example, Alexander Scriabin. And the BSO just recently performed Prometheus, which was this gargantuan piece that Scriabin wrote towards the end of his career. And it was Kuzovitsky who undertook the very difficult premiere. If you remember, it calls also for a light organ. And maybe some of you were at that performance in Symphony Hall last spring when the, there was a, a color organ. Very uh, futuristic kind of music. And Kuzovitsky embraced this as well very early, very early on, not just the classics. He left Russia after the revolution, like so many others, because escaping the chaos and uh, disorder, and it was just very hard to make music in, in Russia after the Russian Revolution, especially in the early years. And he went to Paris, where he joined a whole group fleet of Russians, you could say. All the Russians who were in the ballet, and uh, people like Balanchine and Diaghilev, and he was very much an attraction himself. He had a concert series called the Concert Kuzovitsky, and he uh, premiered a lot of works there. He played a lot of Stravinsky, Prokofiev. Um, you see this quote from uh, Prokofiev here on this slide. It's no secret to anyone that it's impossible to rely on Kuzovitsky's <laughs> taste, but one cannot deny that he knows where the wind is blowing. <laughs> Prokofiev saw this very early on. He comes to Boston in 1924 in autumn, and he became the new conductor of the BSO following Pierre Monteux. And uh, Tom, maybe you can say a little bit about what was the situation of the BSO at that time. Yeah, it was quite a turbulent time for the Boston Symphony because in the era of World War I, the music director of the Boston Symphony was Karl Mook, a German, and there was tremendous anti-German prejudice in the United States during that time because of the Kaiser and because of the war. And Mook was even arrested as a German spy, which he most definitely was not. But it gives you an idea of the, the paranoia of the time. So the orchestra is trying to negotiate this with their music director in jail. Eventually, Henri Rabot was hired from France, a composer and conductor. He lasted for a short time. And then Pierre Monteux came along, one of the most distinguished conductors of his time. He had been associated with the Ballet Russe. He was the conductor who gave the first performance with the ballet, Petrushka, and the Rite of Spring, and I believe Daphnis and Chloe. Tremendous conductor and, and also a bit of a visionary. And it was sometime after about the fourth or fifth year, there was, there was another crisis in the Boston Symphony where the musicians were striking for a better wage. And uh, the, con the concertmaster, Fradkin, was fired, along with, I think, about 20, 25 other players. So it was into this morass that Kuzovitsky stepped in 1924. Yes, and you know, when you think about it, uh, hiring a Russian, of course, he was well known in Paris, but he had never been to America before. Right. before he arrived to become the conductor of the Boston Symphony in 1924. I mean, this was quite uh, an event in, in the history of American music to have a Russian come and take over one of the major orchestras of the, of the, of the country. And on this next slide, Kuzovitsky himself talks about his goals for the BSO. And this is an interview with Gene Hamilton. Mm -hmm. In the, this was about 1944, Christmas Day, national radio broadcast. This is how prominent Kuzovitsky was, and I think it also reflects how important classical music was in the country in, the, in that on Christmas Day, a major radio network would give 20 minutes 
to the conductor of the Boston Symphony to talk about what his career had been up to this point. So he's talking with Gene Hamilton. Hamilton asks him, what were your goals on coming to this country? This is, and this is in 1944, 1944, 20 years after he had come. My first aim was to attain the highest, fullest, and most powerful medium of presenting music and to build up a new standard of orchestral perfection. At the same time, one of my principal aims has been to help the composer, the creative artist, without whom a nation cannot have a potent cultural and artistic life. And you notice uh, his English, of course, was heavily accented. And I don't think he really knew English before he came to the BSO. He would have certainly known French because he had worked in Paris and a lot of Russians knew French anyway as a second language. And I think he knew German because he had worked in Berlin. But his English was halting. But as you can see, he really strove to make himself clear. And you know, one of his friends, the musicologist and writer Nicholas Lonimsky, who actually spent some time in Boston also during the early 1920s, wrote this about Kuzovitsky's speaking in his memoir. Kuzovitsky's English was peculiar. He would ask a rhetorical question and supply a rhetorical answer. You have Mick. <laughs> Deciphered, it meant you have it in the music, then make it. When a player tried to say something during a rehearsal, Kuzovitsky would cut him short with the unequivocal order, me talk, you no speak. <laughs> <laughs> in Russian, a scale is a gamma, and Kuzovitsky thought that in English it was game. Occasionally, he indulged in whimsicalities. Whenever he was dissatisfied with the way the double basses played, he would say, Basie, you play like Basie, of which the price is five cents. <laughs> and he said, ladies and gentlemen, it's easier for me to play nine symphonies of Beethoven than to speak nine words of English. <laughs> but he made himself understood. <laughs> now, Actually, this is also John Barwicki talking about the sound of the BSO, Tom. Yeah. In 1988, I was at Tanglewood, and John Barwicki was just retiring from the Boston Symphony from the bass section. And so I had an opportunity to have a conversation with him, and we have a portion of that here. John was really a keen observer of what was going on in the orchestra, and he paid particular attention to how Kusevitsky achieved the sound that he was able to get. He talked about, in the interview elsewhere, about how Kusevitsky would enter the stage with tremendous reverence. I mean, immediately just silencing everything in the hall. And then as he would walk to the stage and stand on the podium, he said, John said, he would look each one of us in the eye. Whether or not he really did, who knows, but you felt, in, as a member of the orchestra, that he was staring right at you before he gave the downbeat. And then Kusevitsky worked tirelessly on the sound of the Boston Symphony. And this is just one aspect of it, is how Kusevitsky achieved the extraordinary percussion sound that he got. Every instrument had to be a musical sound, but there was the triangle. The fellow hit the triangle and says, no, that doesn't, you feel like a ring of bell. That's, you, I, want you, I want you to hear, you know, a tone out of that. He, he tell me, he said, yeah, that, now that's a little better, you try a little more. And the same thing with the gong. Well, you think as long as he's a little bang, he knows a fellow come up there, you know, a fellow played the gong. He says, uh, he said, gee, well, that sounds like a noise. What kind of a tone is that? So he was very fussy until he says, you find, you find the spot on that. You, you find around that big gong way. He didn't want the ordinary sound. He wanted a beautiful sound, see? And we had a wonderful timpani player. That timpani player was a genius. He was an import from Warsaw Philharmonic. Fantastic man. Well, he used to play that timpani in like a double bass. Oh, the tone. You, you will know the timpani. What do you think, you think it's a nice big bass sound? The timpani player that he's mentioning is Roman Schultz, who was from Warsaw. And Schultz later said he had a different perspective on, on Kuzovitsky and sound because what he said was, when I came to the Boston Symphony, I was the best timpani player in the world. <laughs> 
when Kusevitsky retired from the Boston Symphony, I was the loudest timpani player <laughs> in the world. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, he made some pretty strong choices very early on. He got rid of a, a number of players, and uh, he, there were a lot of French players who came into the orchestra. Yes. Kuzovitsky, having conducted the Concert Kuzovitsky for four years at that point, 1924, and he continued on for another four years or so. So when he left the BSO, he would go to Paris and conduct another season of the, of the Concert Kuzovitsky. So he knew every orchestral player in Paris, and he brought many of them to the BSO, including Roger Voisin's father. Voisin was in the trumpet section of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and eventually the son joined his father in the trumpet section. And he said, for the first 10 years I was in the Boston Symphony Orchestra, I never spoke a word of English. All I had to do was speak French. Right. <laughs> And you know, although Kuzovitsky was a great defender of American democracy, and he often spoke about it later on, and such a proud American citizen, but when he was on the podium, he was an autocrat, <laughs> and there, there was no question about it. And some of the players found him very difficult because he was quite authoritarian. But um, this was, of course, not that unusual in the context of the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one, of course, one has to also say that the orchestra was basically all white men, but that was also the way things were with orchestras at, at that time. But he definitely didn't want to hear necessarily what the players had to say. He, he knew best. And as Tom describes how he would come out on stage, Leonard Bernstein, in an interview, mentioned this how he learned how to come out on stage from observing Kuzovitsky, who would gather himself backstage in this very regal manner. Mm -hmm. And you know, he liked to wear capes and all the, the costumes that gave him sort of authority and panache, and it was very dramatic. He, he was a very dramatic sort of conductor, yes. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Kuzovitsky was really part of this Russian emigration that flooded France, and then many of them came to America. Sergei Rachmaninov, who arrived in 1918. Igor Stravinsky, who came, first lived in Europe, but came to America, and then lived in Los Angeles longer than he ever lived in Russia, actually. <laughs> Sergei Prokofiev, who came here for a time. Vladimir Horowitz. Alexander Silotti, who became an important figure at Juilliard School. Leopold Auer, who taught violin at Juilliard School. Vernon Duke, who you might know as Vladimir Dukelsky, the Broadway composer. So there was this huge emigration of Russians fleeing communism or just really the chaos. But you know, one of the things that's so interesting about Kuzovitsky that I find as a historian of Russia, and especially the Russian immigration, he was able to maintain diplomatic relations with the Soviet regime. He never said anything impolitic like Rachmaninoff did, which made him a non-person. And he became especially close to Soviet and Russian composers during World War II, and I'll, I'll get to that later. But of course, what we most are thinking about him today is as a champion of American music. And he championed all these American composers, some of whom we don't remember today, some of them we do, Aaron Copeland, David Diamond. And t tell them a little bit about this photograph, Tom. Yeah, this is backstage after one of the premiere performances. So Kuzovitsky standing next to Nadia Boulanger, and then between them, with his head poking up, is Roy Harris. At Kuzovitsky's left, I guess it is, is Mabel Daniels, who was a fantastic composer. Kuzovitsky, I believe, played some of his music uh, her music with the Boston Symphony. Is that William Schumann? That's not William Schumann on the left, is it? I, I think it is. Yeah. yeah. So all of these great composers were backstage constantly, whether or not their music was being performed. Kuzovitsky kind of expected everyone to come to his concerts. David Diamond, who we'll talk about in a little bit, told a great story that he was, uh, he was backstage one time and he was with his sister and she was just gushing about how wonderful this week's concert was. And he said, so, what was wrong with last week? <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, it's interesting that it, it was a Russian, Kuzovitsky, who did so much to promote new American music. You know, and one of the things he said was, if we don't play the new music, we won't have the old. So 
this was really unusual for a, a conductor at the time, to be that devoted to young composers and, and new music and try out a lot of scores. And if you want to read more about this, Hugo Leichentritt's book on Serge Kuzovitsky, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and the New American Music, he goes into a whole chronicle of all the different composers that Kuzovitsky sponsored and all the premieres that he did. And he would devote enormous time to these new scores, too. It wasn't just an afterthought to the classics. They were really central to his mission at the, at the Boston Symphony. And of course, one of the composers he was most involved with was Aaron Copland. And notice the incredible number of American works that were performed during, during this time, 162. <laughs> so this is you know, a record, certainly. I don't know if it's ever been matched, actually. And here's Aaron Copland talking about Kuzovitsky. When Dr. Kusevitsky told me he was going to play one of my new pieces, that meant that I would go to Boston from New York and live in the house. And every day, every evening, we would sit together for several hours going over the piece, talking about the piece, talking about the difficulties or the easy parts or what I had done wrong or what might be bettered. Uh, we lived the thing together and there was nothing at all casual about um, what was going to happen at the Boston Symphony that week. The whole week, in his mind, was planned in relation to that new piece. The other works on that same program were chosen so that he wouldn't have to spend much time on them. They'd be works familiar to the orchestra already, so that he'd have plenty of time, more than the usual amount, to work on your new piece. <laughs> That was Kuzovitsky conducting the Boston Symphony. That recording was made less than a month after the premiere of the Appalachian Spring Suite, which took place in New York uh, under a different orchestra, some philharmonic or something there. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> some uh, minor orchestra. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the authority that he had in taking a brand new piece and getting that kind of majestic sound out of it is just amazing. And speaking of sound, you can see in this picture, one of the things that John Barwicky mentioned to me when I did that interview uh, that you heard earlier is that Kuzovitsky wanted people to hear the difference between the sound of the bass section and the cellos. And, you know, normally the basses are seated directly behind the cello section. Not so. If you look in this orchestra, the cellos are on Kuzovitsky's right and the bass section is way in the back on the left. He wanted to make sure you could hear that difference. And unfortunately, Kuzovitsky never recorded in stereo, so we can't hear that now. But those who were in the hall at the time could take advantage of this special kind of sound that he was able to get. Yeah. And another American composer he promoted was David Diamond, particularly this work, Rounds. And this is David Diamond talking about a performance, and Tom can fill in some details here. Yeah. Kuzovitsky went to Rochester, New York, and attended Howard Hansen's performance of Rounds by David Diamond, and he was furious. And so this is David Diamond talking about what Kuzovitsky's reaction was to this really poorly prepared performance. And how he did better. Yes. <laughs> I would send pieces, but it was not until he heard a lousy performance that Hansen did at Columbia University for the Ditson Fund of my rounds, and typically what happened was typical Hansen nonsense. He rehearsed his own symphony for most of the time and left 20 minutes for my rounds, and of course it was a butchered. I mean, they could, they could barely get through the notes because he hadn't rehearsed it, you see. Well, Kusevitsky caught on to this, and he let Hansen have it. And he just, Howard, you did this? And 
to Howard. He turned red, always, he was always getting red, but would never say anything more than blah, 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 blah. But that's what happened. And then he turned to me and says, I will show how we play this piece. And by God, he did. One, two, three, four. Uh, uh, uh. That's a rehearsal, by the way. That's not even the polished final performance. But one thing I, I think you really can hear that in that and some of the other excerpts we're going to play is the speed. Kusevitsky liked it fast, and, and he had a string section that could keep up with him. Right, and we'll hear that in the Shostakovich yes. 8th Symphony yes. later on, too. Now, of course, Leonard Bernstein and Kuzovitsky, this was a very important relationship for both of them. And if you saw Maestro, you remember the scene when Kuzovitsky and Bernstein's at Saranac and they're sitting around the table and he tells Bernstein, well, I think you need to change your name to Burns. <laughs> and uh, apparently this did happen. But Bernstein was his protege. He had hoped he would take over the Boston yeah. Symphony, of course, although he didn't, he went to New York instead. But for Bernstein, this was an absolutely uh, essential relationship in how he became who he was, as he said. I read in the paper somewhere that Serge Kusevitsky was opening a school that summer to be known as the Berkshire Music Center. And I decided, of course, I had to go to that. So I rounded up all the letters of recommendation I could. One was from Fritz Reiner, one was from Aaron, bless him. One was from... William Schumann, bless him, Roy Harris, the various musicians I had met of prowess and dignity and importance. And armed with this sheaf of letters, I arrived at Symphony Hall, shaking. I can't tell you in what a way I was shaking. I presented these letters, which he didn't even read, and he said, please sit down. We talked about one thing and another, and suddenly he said, but of course I will take you in my class. And I thought, well, this is incredible. I mean, isn't he going to ask me to beat three or play the piano or, or do something to audition? Nothing. And he hadn't even read these letters. And I suddenly realized that there was an innate genetic connection. From that moment when he said, please sit down, and I sat down, it was a love affair. It was... Uh, a father and son relationship, if you like, a surrogate father. But it was more than that. I can't even name it. And from that moment until the moment he died, literally, I think I was the last one to talk to him. The night before he died, I held him in my arms in the hospital, and we talked for three hours. And the last thing I remember his saying to me was, uh, keep the Tanglewood dream growing. And as I mentioned, you know, he was a father figure to many composers, and one of them was Prokofiev, who was 20 years younger. He sponsored Prokofiev's career from the very beginning. Last spring, the BSO played his fourth symphony that was commissioned by the BSO. He invited Prokofiev to come here and play at the BSO himself as a soloist. Prokofiev was not always the easiest person, and, and Kuzovitsky often had to sort of put him in his place. But they had a very strong relationship for 20 years until Prokofiev decided to go back to Soviet Russia and sort of, you know, disappeared on the other edge of the world. So he was a very important mentor. That was a very huge part of what he did. And then, of course, there's the story of Tanglewood, which could by, be by itself an entire <laughs> session. But it was Kuzovitsky who had this dream of setting up this festival, as I mentioned, maybe inspired by the Russian festivals that he had known before the Russian Revolution. And there was a gift of this estate uh, given to the BSO in 1936-37. That house, of course, is still there. And then, but he wanted there to be a big shed, which, of course, is the great Kuzovitsky shed that's there today. That was built in 1937-38. Uh, originally, it was going to be designed by Saarinen, but he didn't like uh, the way that was turning out, and so they used a local architect instead, and, of course, with very good results. <laughs> and as a part of Tanglewood, also, he wanted there to be a school, 
and he set up the Tanglewood Music Center where students came every summer. And of course that has continued to the present day and has trained so many important musicians and composers in, in American music. And I would also mention his very strong connection to Russian music. He was very interested in Shostakovich, Khachaturian, uh, his Tchaikovsky, as Tom mentioned, was very special. This is an excerpt from a performance of Shostakovich's Eighth Symphony, which was written during World War II. This was, uh, I think, one of the first performances outside of the Soviet Union. And uh, it was a national broadcast. Kuzovitsky performed the entire symphony. He only recorded the first movement of it. And that's been hard to obtain on, on records. So this is, this is a portion of the scherzo. And I just, I wanted you to hear this in particular because of the incisiveness of the playing, the sharp attacks that you'll hear, and the brisk pace. If, you, if you're familiar with the Nelson's recording, it's much more sedate. Kuzovitsky didn't view this music that way. Such energy, yeah. <laughs> incredible energy. And you know, it, it, it's um, tribute to how expansive Kuzovitsky's taste was, mm -hmm. that on the one hand he appreciated Shostakovich, and on the other, Stravinsky. <laughs> and you know, Stravinsky who had very little nice to say about Shostakovich, <laughs> as a matter of fact. He didn't have much nice to say about Kuzovitsky either. <laughs> so that's right. a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> And another piece that he introduced, and a composer who he introduced really in America was Aram Khachaturian, the Armenian, Soviet, Russian composer. And he premiered in America this piano concerto that Khachaturian had written. And William Capel recorded this piece with the BSO and it became a bestseller actually. And it was a very unusual piece incorporating Armenian folk music and really in announced Khachaturian as a new voice. And this recording put Capel on the map. You know, he was a very brilliant rising pianist. Sadly, he died in an airplane crash in, I think, 1951. One interesting sidelight about this recording was that they recorded, Capel and, and the BSO and Kuzovitsky recorded this piece twice. And the first recording, Kuzovitsky was not satisfied with. He didn't think Capel was prepared well enough. This was sort of the beginning of the jet set era and Capel was going all over the country performing. He came into the recording session just a few minutes before the session was supposed to start. So they didn't have time to do an additional rehearsal. They had played the work together before, but they had not rehearsed it recently. Kuzovitsky rejected the whole thing, made them record it all over again. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and in our excitement, jumped out of the pond. Eleanor Roosevelt. 
which was also recorded. But no matter how hard the duck tried to run. But finally, this brings us to Kuzovitsky and Benjamin Britten. We're going to be hearing the last movement of Britten's second quartet in, in just a moment with players from the Boston Symphony. But Benjamin Britten was one of the composers that Kuzovitsky offered refuge to, basically, during World War II. Another one was Bela Bartok, the Hungarian who had to flee Hungarian fascism. Both of them, Kuzovitsky sort of brought into his fold. He reinvigorated Bela Bartok's career, actually. He was interested in Britain early on. He conducted his uh, Symphonia di Requiem, and he asked Britain, why aren't you writing an opera? You really ought to write an opera. Benjamin Britten said, well, the reason is I don't have the money. I would have to have a commission for that. So what did he do? He gave him a commission. <laughs> Uh, $1,000, which really wasn't much even then. But with that commission, he did go ahead and, and write Peter Grimes, this wonderful, which became his most popular and maybe arguably important uh, opera. And uh, originally he had said it had to be performed first at Tanglewood, but because of the war, that didn't happen. It did have a performance in England first, but then there was a performance at Tanglewood in the small theater, and it was a student performance Britain wasn't terribly happy with it, but it was a really important event and kept the promise that he had made to Kuzovitsky. Later, actually in 1996, I was lucky enough to be at the 50th anniversary celebration performance of that, of Peter Grimes in that same, in that same theater. And so, that 1946 performance at Tanglewood was led by Leonard Bernstein. Right. Right, and Leonard Bernstein conducted that performance, that's right. His relationship with Britain continued. Afterward, he also commissioned the Spring Symphony from him. And this string quartet number two that we're going to hear right now was written just after Peter Grimes. And actually, he told a friend that uh, he had the idea for this quartet at the back of his mind when he was composing Peter Grimes. It was intended as an homage to Henry Purcell on the 250th anniversary of his death, especially the final movement, Chaconi, which is what you're going to hear in just a moment. And then finally, he did also commission Symphony, which Britain dedicated to the BSO and was premiered. Well, it wasn't premiered, but it was performed at Tanglewood very soon after it was written. Kuzovitsky retired in 1949, died not long afterward in 1951, and if you remember what Leonard Bernstein said earlier, his last words were, keep the Tanglewood dream growing. Growing is the key word, Tanglewood, here. The dream is palpable. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you.
very much. That was beautiful, really beautiful. Thank you to the BSO, to Tom, to Harlow. I don't know about you, but I am walking away tonight having learned so much, and we're not done. We have one more performance in the Pierce Performance Series. Please come back November 19th. Uh, we will be learning from Ed Barker about the double bass. Thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your evening.